The game of Pong, so simple, so archaic, and yet perhaps the most important in video game history. The game's impact is staggering to consider. It basically established video games as an industry. It brought us the first console, the first hit arcade, the first dedicated console, and it was a bedrock game in virtually every one of the first cartridge-based consoles. And in future generations, it continued to be released for consoles and computers, recently having, just a handful of years ago, an official release on Windows and iOS. And Pong games are set to be included in the new 2020 console, the Intellivision Amico. Pong was also a foundational element for the video game industry. Some would build on the mechanics of Pong, adding little elements of graphics or gameplay to create new games and even new genres of games. And that's how Breakout came about. But perhaps the most obscure, the most overlooked, and most little known corner of Pong history is a genre of Pong that you probably didn't even know existed. Mechanical Pong, or call it Steampunk Pong. That is, games of Pong that don't use a video screen, but instead use primitive mechanical machines, relays, and simple electrical wiring. For most people, they've never heard of such a thing until the recent Atari Pong cocktail table, which has become quite a success. But that just scratches the surface. Most people are completely unaware that there was an entire genre of games devoted to replicating what Pong was into a physical, mechanical game, a genre that goes back decades, and even has precursors of Pong that may go back a century. Yes, it's the history of Pong's strangest genre, mechanical and electromechanical Pong, one of the most obscure corners of game history, and you won't find this story anywhere else but here, and it's coming up next. Hello heroes, 4 here, and today we're looking back at a piece of game history I feel I've been forced to cover. Why? Because it's so obscure, no one else is going to do it. Now as we look back into gaming history to see if we can find versions of Pong done in a mechanical format, we should establish just what makes a Pong game a Pong game. First we need to take a look at the origins of Pong in lightning fast speed. In 1958, William Higginbotham created Tennis for Two on the Brookhaven National Laboratory's analog computer as an interactive visual exhibit for a public exhibition. In mid-1972, Magnavox released Ralph Baer's Pong home console, The Odyssey. And in September of that year, Atari released the Pong arcade game, followed by a dedicated console in 1975. And over these years, literally hundreds of companies copied and ripped off Pong for their own games, creating hundreds, maybe thousands of Pong games. But at their heart, they were really games about batting a ball back and forth, trying to score a goal. So it's pretty straightforward what a Pong game is in gameplay, but also of note was how Pong games were branded and marketed, most commonly as sports games and often as racket-based games. Higginbotham set the tone when he called his game Tennis for Two. Ralph Baer continued the racket theme by branding some of his games on the Odyssey as Table Tennis and Tennis. And of course, Bushnell named his game Pong, short for Ping Pong. Many of the Pong clones followed suit, branding their own games after these sports, or others like racquetball and squash. And as Pong games added goals and additional paddles to represent teammates, it was common to brand the games as soccer or hockey or other sports. So we have an idea of what people would expect from a Pong game. Paddle game, hitting a ball back and forth, usually head-to-head -head gameplay and often branded as racket sports like tennis and ping pong, sometimes others like hockey and soccer. Now that we're armed with the basic criteria, we can look back and see what qualifies as a Pong game. And we can look even further back into game history and ask, were there mechanical precursors to Pong? Actually, these criteria fit games going back to the earliest arcade games, the Penny Arcades. Amusement machines go back to the late 1800s, and by the 1890s, we see the first arcade games that used bats to bat a ball back and forth, or used figurines called mannequins. In 1893, Graydon Poor filed a patent in London for the very first two-player ball batting game, with scoring goals behind each player. The head-to-head -head ball batting game was born, a genre that would eventually lead to Pong nearly 80 years later. And also, it would lead to the birth of the head-to-head -head pinball genre, but more on that later. 
Over the next decade or so, this type of game began to flourish, and usually they were branded as popular sports of the day, like tennis and soccer. And when there was a surge in popularity of table tennis in the early 1900s, the first branded ping pong games hit the market. Unfortunately, most of these games prior to the 1920s are lost to history, or if they aren't, they're sitting in some collector's mansion because pictures are hard to come by, really, until games that were coming out in the 20s and 30s. The earliest ball batting game I could find pictures of was this Chester Pollard soccer-themed game from the 1920s. So what was the first racket-themed arcade game? Well, the earliest I could find was this obscure French game called Le Tennis, a pre-electrical mechanical game. This ball batting game replicates a doubles tennis court. If a player fails to bat back an incoming ball, the ball enters the scoring hole behind the player. The gameplay is a direct descendant from Graydon's 1893 design, but converted into doubles tennis play. But I couldn't find any information about the game online, no manufacturer or release date, but it's estimated to be from around 1932. Regardless, it's visual proof that even in the earliest days of mechanical arcade games, we can see gameplay mechanics very similar to what eventually became Pong. But as we continue to go through history looking for these examples, the link between mechanical games and Pong will only get stronger. The first actual table tennis theme game I could find pictures of was Exhibit Supply Company's Ping Pong from 1938. You can see the playfield was simplified from the doubles play of Le Tennis to singles play, and the colorful larger figurines or mannequins better evoke the game's theme. And Ping Pong added side-out traps on each side of the playfield. If a player hits the ball too wide, they can lose a point as a side-out. And just like with the video game Pong, this format of player versus player mechanical gameplay would be adapted and rebranded for other sports, like hockey. One of the most iconic of these was Goalie, from the classic arcade manufacturer Chicago Coin. You can see that Goalie is almost the same exact game as Exhibit Supply's Ping Pong. The players with the rackets were replaced with mannequins that were hockey players, and you can see that it has the same stretched octagonal play field. And of course, it removed the side out traps, well, since it's hockey and there's no side outs. Goalie was a popular game for Chicago Coin and became a brand for them. It was produced for years, and they re released updated versions in the late 40s and the 50s. And when Chicago Coin tried to get into the video game market in the early 70s by rushing out their own Pong clones, they revived the Goalie brand as one of their first video games. And all of this probably makes Goalie one of the prominent early franchises in player v player games and one of the first to make the leap from electromechanical game to video game, making it one of the most direct lines from mechanical games to Pong we've seen so far. But long before Pong, games like Goalie and Ping Pong had another unique impact on gaming history, as they helped lead to the creation of player versus player head-to-head -head pinball. As mentioned previously, the ball bat mechanism was a precursor to the modern flipper, which was a critical element in the creation of pinball. Similarly, these head-to-head -head ball batting games were the precursors to the very first head-to-head -head player versus player pinball. This first happened in 1953 with Exhibit Supply Company's Electric Hockey, the first head-to-head -head pinball machine. Pinball designers took the basics of the ball batting game and then they innovated with them. They stretched the octagonal shape to give a longer play field, giving them more room to put in bumpers or other trappings of pinball. Electric Hockey added bumpers on the angled walls and along the sides. But aside from a lone bumper in the center, the playfield is generally open, just like the playfield of the sport it was emulating. Except, of course, all those flippers. Yes, just like how designers added extra paddles to Pong to try to morph it into different sports like hockey, electric hockey riddled the playfield with flippers, ostensibly to represent the hockey players. Twelve flippers in all, the first pinball machine to have that many. Over the next decade or two, a number of double-sided player-versus-player head-to-head pinball machines would come out, many of which would fill the playfield with the trappings of pinball games like targets and bumpers. But some of them would harken back to the sports they were themed after, keeping a relatively open playfield that looks like a real soccer field or a real tennis court. 
Many of these arcade games were European, where those sports are especially popular. Player versus player pinball is actually a deep and very unexplored topic, and we're working on a comprehensive look at the history of head-to-head -head pinball. Check out our video in the upper right corner. So you can see by the 1960s, the idea of Pong-type game mechanics as a physical machine was a common genre and had been in arcades for decades. But of course, just around the corner was 1972, and the real Pong video game would come out. First in the form of the Magnavox Odyssey home console, which was a mild success, and then in Atari's Pong arcade game, which was a smash hit. As companies raced to rip off Pong for their own video arcade games, not many people seem to notice Midway's attempt to replicate the Pong gameplay into an electromechanical game, Table Tennis. Table Tennis was a wall game, a large flat game usually intended to be mounted on the walls of bars and saloons to get some extra profit from space they weren't using before anyways. It's also what's known as a timing game in that there's little gameplay to it. You hit a button at the right moment, in this case when the ball approaches your player, and if timed right, it sends the ball back to your opponent. Here's a look at the game without the front screen. Note the mechanical device that makes the sound of the paddle hitting the ball when the player times it successfully. Table tennis is a bit of a forgotten game. I'm not sure if it came out before or after Pong, but Midway was likely aware of Pong long before it came out. Bushnell had been shopping it around to other arcade manufacturers before deciding to have Atari do it in-house. So it's very possible that Table Tennis was Midway responding with their own ping pong game, but in a medium Midway was more comfortable with. Old school and low cost electromechanical games. But we probably won't ever know for sure. However, there's no doubt our next entry was definitely attempting to cash in on the pong craze of the mid 70s. And whereas if the games we've covered so far could be considered mechanical and electromechanical arcade versions of pong, then this would be the electromechanical home console version of Pong. Mark's Toys TV Tennis. Yes, in 1974, two years after the Pong arcade and a year before it came to homes via dedicated consoles, there was a toy called TV Tennis from legendary company Mark's Toys, most famous for creating the Rock'em Sock'em Robots. Of course, by this time, Pong had gone from arcade success to cultural sensation. And Marx was clearly trying to capitalize on that. The physical unit itself was actually designed to look like a TV picture tube. And they even named the toy TV Tennis, a common branding approach for early Pong video games. Before the term video game became a term, these arcade games were often called TV games, and many arcade manufacturers leaned into that branding, calling their games TV and then whatever the sport was. So there's really no doubt this game was intended to be a low-cost mechanical version of Pong for the home. But what the heck exactly was it? Well, it actually is pretty amazing. You'd think it had some early primitive circuitry, but it doesn't. Electricity does power a motor and the light on the ball, but that's it. The toy was a big hit for Marx, and you can see why. While it was pretending to be high-tech, it was actually simple and cheap to produce. Marx brought out a new version of the toy in 1975, the same year that Atari released the actual Pong home video game console. You might think this would spell doom for TV Tennis, but it may have actually helped it. TV Tennis cost 15 to 20 bucks, and Atari's Pong console came in at $100. That's over $500 in today's money. So instead of squeezing the Mark's toy off the shelves, TV Tennis actually provided a cheap alternative, a poor man's Pong, if you will, that many parents snapped up and brought home to many disappointed kids hoping for the video game. Of course, that was all over in 1976. By that time, Mark's found themselves competing with a deluge of Pong console clones, so many that a glut led to a crash for Pong consoles, driving retailers to slash prices. With its precious pricing edge dwindling, the Mark's TV tennis toys took a pounding and were soon gone from toy shelves, becoming a long-forgotten footnote in gaming history. But for a while, Mark's had a hit, and they came out with several variations on the branding of TV tennis. Can you guess what the others were? Yep, TV hockey and TV soccer. 
Like the mechanical ancestors and like Pong itself, the same exact gameplay being themed and branded as the same exact sports. And Marx's soccer game actually licensed the likeness of 70s soccer superstar Pele in an early example of personal sports endorsements in tech games, or at least in games pretending to be tech games. There was also an international equivalent to the Marx toy, like this electric tennis from Spain. But this toy also popped up throughout Europe. I found examples in the UK and in France, though I have no idea in which of these countries it originated from. So by now, we've looked at mechanical and electromechanical versions of Pong, done as arcade games and as the equivalent of a home console. But our next entry will bring the genre of electromechanical Pong to the handheld. Yes, in 1977, the Marks TV toys may have been gone, but there was a newcomer to toy shelves everywhere. Blip, the digital game. Blip is the digital game that you can take with you anywhere. With the batteries you supply, the light-emitting diode zips across the screen. You try to press the... In the 1970s, Japanese company Tomy had established a successful track record with electromechanical handheld games. And while the Pong craze had faded for arcades and dedicated consoles, kids were thrilled at the possibility to have a handheld version of the game. In 1977, Blip was one of the hottest-selling toys of the holiday season. Though Blip was billed as the digital game, that was purely a marketing concoction. Actual digital handheld games did exist in 1977. I did a video previously on the LED handhelds and their unique place in gaming and video gaming history. Link in the upper right corner. But Blip was most certainly not a digital game, or even an electronic game. In fact, it barely qualifies as an electric game. So what actually was Blip? The ball is actually a pretty amazing engineering feat. It's controlled by a complex set of gears which move the ball in one of a series of preset moves and the gears also randomize the moves, giving the feeling of the ball's path almost being as random as the video game pong. It's pretty impressive. And Blip went even more retro. Whereas TV Tennis used an electrical motor for its motion, Blip had a wind-up motor that uses no electricity. Blip does use batteries, but only to light the ball, so technically, if you're in a well-lit room, you can actually see the ball through the screen anyways, and you can wind up the game and play it without any electrical power at all. Blip the digital game? Despite the marketing lie, it was an impressive piece of engineering, and it was a smash hit in sales, and has a unique place in handheld game history. So you can see the idea of mechanical or electromechanical Pong is an idea that's been around for a long time, and in some occasions was clearly trying to be Pong. And yet many people were surprised when mechanical Pong recently became a trending topic with the Atari Pong Countertop Arcade, which started back in 2017 as a Kickstarter campaign, but was so successful it's now become a commercially available product. I didn't realize it until I ran across this footage online of the machine with the playfield removed, showing the mechanics underneath in action. And that engineering to make Pong into a mechanical game, but with today's modern technology, it's just crazy. But it's only the latest in a long line of modern crazy mechanical Pong games, as there have been similar games popping up on the internet as DIY projects going back at least as far as this 2006 project from Germany called Pong Mechanic. Pong Mechanic is an electromechanic variant. You can see the machine uses string and pulleys to move the paddles and ball laterally, and other moving mechanics to move the ball downfield. And of course, there have been other strange and crazy attempts to do physical Pong games. If you look at the 2014 South by Southwest, there was an exhibition of a giant human sized Pong game with a 30 foot by 60 foot play field. The gameplay was slow, not very high on challenge, but still pretty cool to see a physical Pong game that huge. Human sized Pong. So, we can see that the video game Pong actually has a rich connection and history with mechanical and electromechanical gaming in arcades, in the home, and on the go. Games that use the video game mechanics but with physical tactile machines, and in some cases they were directly trying to cash in on all that Pong hoopla. 
Games made of old-fashioned but innovative mechanical devices engineered to deliver a Pong experience in the available technology of the time or simply at a lower cost. An obscure but fascinating corner in video game history, and if you've watched this far, you probably like that kind of thing. So please consider giving us a thumbs up, subscribing, and sharing this weird video game history with your friends on social media. And we'll see you here next time on Hero Journalism. <laughs>